I guess the next 40 minutes is a crystallization of things that have been working through my brain over the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, my brain works real slow, so I think you'll find 40 minutes is more than enough to get that information out there to you all. But uh, just in case it's not, um, uh, me and my friend uh, Mike Lucides are writing an article about this as well that will appear in O'Reilly uh, Radar in a couple of weeks. So um, I'll make sure O'Reilly gets that paper out to uh, all you guys <coughs> so you can see the, the version with pictures and everything. Um, had a few late nights this week, so I haven't drawn any pictures for this particular one. So um, as I started off by saying, I think the people in this audience who are interested in both the hardcore algorithms, the guys who came to my Tuesday workshop, and also are thinking about how to actually use those to drive real value uh, is much less common than I'd like. Um, I feel like in the last 15 or 20 years, most of the modeling and data analysis and collection I've seen done has not turned into stuff that helps human beings with their lives. <coughs> And, you know, I've been reflecting about why that is. And I think it's a problem of process, it's a problem of framework, it's a problem of, of a way of thinking. And so I wanted to lay out a framework which might help you make sure that your analysis, your data, uh, is actually driving you towards something that helps human beings with their lives. So I guess the first thing to be aware of is that when you build a predictive model, you're not making anything happen you're not causing actions to occur, you're not causing behaviour to change. All you're doing is you're predicting something. And most of the time, predicting something is not of itself something that then can tell somebody what to do or tell a machine how to operate. So how do we try to get to a point where we're actually using our analysis and our data in a way that is to use a bit of consulting -y jargon, delivering value. And I'd like to give an example in order to explain one way of thinking about this. So if I think back to the mid-90s, that's way before my time, but apparently there was a search engine around back then called Alta Vista, which was uh, the hot thing. And uh, Alta Vista was kind of kicking ass a bit at that point because Yahoo, which uh, I'm told was the other interesting uh, index of those days, was human edited. So there was a team of, of people who curated the world's websites and put them manually into a hierarchy that then you could browse. So Alta Vista, which I think was a, a digital um, brand, uh, used an approach which was slightly more algorithmic. They actually just went out there and, and surf the web automatically, what nowadays we would call, you know, kind of robots or scraping or whatever else, indexing. And they just put all that data up there so that you could search it. But that in itself was kind of disappointing because often you would search for something which was maybe a little bit generic. It was getting to the point where the internet was starting to get kind of big. Um, not like in the days of like Gopher and stuff where you'd search and you'd be lucky to get one hit. And it started to get to the point that you'd have hundreds of pages and you didn't know where the good stuff was. So Google came along. And I was not privy to these discussions, but I think if you think about the way Google perhaps was designed, it tells you a lot about how to drive real value using models and using data. So here's one way of thinking about this. It's a four-step process. Step one is to identify the objective. So in the web search case, the objective presumably is to find that web page that you actually want to read based on the information about the query that you've provided. So there's the objective. Step two, figure out what levers you have to pull. So the levers you have to pull are the things that you can actually change yourself. So in this case, Yahoo thought the levers they could pull would be what websites do we curate? Alta Vista thought the lever they could pull was how many sites can we crawl? Google thought something really interesting. The lever we have to pull is the ordering of sites that we give you back. And really, I don't think anybody before that had realised that this sorting of sites is the big lever. Step three. What data do we have or what data can we collect which hooks up those levers to the outcome that we want? And again, here Google answered this in a really creative way. The data on the web about who links to who tells us about what kinds of websites people that like X might also like Y. 
So step four now is to somehow hook together the levers to the objective using the data. And in Google's case, that was a simple process of inventing a totally new data mining algorithm, PhD worthy at Stanford University, and calling it PageRank. So that's how you build Google. It's all going well so far, perhaps until we hit step four. Um, and so I am no Stanford PhD, well, not that they got their PhD, but Stanford PhD candidate. Um, as you guys who came to my uh, Tuesday talk know, I'm just an Aussie philosopher. So back in 1999, I kind of was thinking about this, this four steps. So let's, let's maybe, let's lay them out here. So step one was figure out an objective. I really should type, I'm such a bad writer, sorry. Step two, what levers do we have we can pull? What can we change? Step three, what data do we have or can we collect? Step four, write your PhD quality algorithm. We're gonna try and replace that with something else soon, okay? So back in those days, I was working in management consulting. Don't worry, I'm nearly fully recovered now. <coughs> and uh, I was working in the insurance industry. And so in management consulting, this kind of three-step process without the PhD bit is kind of the way we tended to think about problems in business strategy. And so I was working in insurance, and step one in insurance, what's the objective? Make shitloads of money, okay? And more particularly, maximize the profit from each customer or each application that comes our way. So that one's easy. Step two, what are the levers I have to pull? So unless you've kind of thought about insurance much, which if you've got a life you haven't, um, but I did quite a lot because I was a consultant, um, is the price that you can charge is the lever you can pull in insurance. As I say in insurance, the price is the product. There ain't nothing else being transacted here, right? So it comes down to a simple question of how do I change price to make shitloads of money? What data do I have? Wow, I got a lot, right? I know about your driving history. There's stuff I can look up on the um, various databases that you wouldn't even believe. They know everything about your vehicle. They know who you've insured with in the past. I've got information on your application. I know stuff like when you called us, uh, what sex you were. Uh, there's a lot of data I can use to hook up these two things together. So, Back in 1999, I kind of thought, that's interesting. You know, how are people hooking these things together? And I discovered that they're not. There were these people called actuaries who had spent decades building very, very sophisticated predictive models. Very sophisticated. Way more sophisticated than any product manager could ever understand. So here's what happened in an actual pricing meeting that I observed. Actuary comes in. Here is my goddamn sophisticated report based on general linear modeling regression. It's going to blow your mind. Product manager, wow. So how about 18 to 25 age group? Oh, I hear our competitors just raised the price by 30%. Okay, let's match them. That's how pricing was done in insurance. Okay. So I thought, can I create a step four in insurance? So back in 1999, I started a new company called the Optimal Decisions Group, which from now on I'll call ODG. And I tried to find a step four. And what I did was I created a new kind of, well, not a new kind of step four, but a particular kind of step four which I reckon anybody in this audience could do. Even I could do it. Here's what I did. The first thing is I thought, what predictive models can I build which tell me something about the outcome I'm trying to achieve? So let's lay this out. So I'm trying to maximize profit based on price for each individual customer that comes in the door. Okay, so here's one customer, and here's the price that I'm going to charge them. And what I want over here is my expected profit. What does this shape look like? Well, let's break it down. This very simply is the probability that this person will accept my offer, given that I give them some particular price. Times the profit that I will get from them, assuming that they accept my offer. Right? 
Yeah, McKinsey guys can do math too. We're not so bad, right? So let's draw what these probably look like. So even when I was a consultant, I was able to get this far. So here's again price. So when my um, charging nothing at all, I'm probably going to get something like 100% of customers. It's actually less than 100%, by the way, because a lot of calls that come into insurers are actually from other insurers trying to find out what you're charging. So it turns out to be about 80%. When I charge a massive amount of money, I'll probably get about zero. And between the two, we're going to have something which looks like what we call a sigmoid function. Okay? So I don't know how we draw that yet. Let's come back to it. But we'd like to draw that. What about this? What's the profit assuming that somebody accepts? Well, given that they've accepted, if I charge nothing at all, then I'm going to make a loss. And the amount of loss that I'm going to make is basically the expected claims, plus expenses. But you know, who cares about them for now? And then for each extra dollar that I charge, I'm going to make one extra dollar of profit. OK, so this is just a y equals x line offset by a little bit. So now we are going to multiply these two together, this times this. So that means that at this point, we've basically got a constant, so it's going to be exactly the same as the initial graph, and then it'll slowly curve off, and then eventually that asymptoting to zero will take over, and that would be our graph. So that was my goal. My goal was for everybody that came into my client's firm was I was going to try and draw this graph, because then I could just find this bit at the top. So let's talk about this. What I've got now is some models that I'm trying to build, which I reckon I can combine together to do what I want to do. All right? So in order to build these models, I'm going to need some data. And this is a, one of the big insights I want you to take away from this. We generally talk a lot about the data exhaust. We talk about the data that our, that our companies are collecting. Really what you want is data that tells you about causality, not correlation. I want to know if I charge this much, this is the probability he's going to accept my offer. We'll talk more about this in a moment. Okay? Generally speaking, you do not have data about causality. You've got data about business as usual. You don't know what happens if you do some weird shit. Okay? So in this case, I needed data about what happens if you charge differently. So I'll tell you what I did. And can you imagine how my CEO clients felt about this? I told them, you have to randomly set prices for the next six months. I did. And <laughs> they thought that was an interesting idea. Um, and they said no. And so then I said, OK, OK, I understand. This is going to be valuable to you, and I'm going to prove it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a simulator. I'm going to build some predictive models that predict what's going to happen based on what limited understanding I have from your data. And I'm going to show you with that simulator what's going to happen in the next month. The simulator turned out to give the right answer. I got to a point where my clients trusted my models well enough that I could then simulate for them the difference between running these randomized experiments and not, and showing them that they could make a shitload of money, which of course is their objective. So we ended up doing it. Um, we did this for dozens of clients all around the world. So they randomly changed their prices for six months, and they got together a truly causal data set. When you change your price, this is how people respond. Not in some global way. This is not some A-B test. This is building a really, really rich data set from which you use the random forests and the GLM nets that Dr. Mike and I taught you about on Tuesday. Right? With this data set, we can now go in and there really is not room for my graphics tablet here. Uh, we can now go in and draw this curve for every single person that comes in our door using the magic of predictive modeling. And here's the other cool thing. We did this not only for new business, but also renewals. So when people came back and they said, I want to renew my policy, we started sending out random prices for next year, just to see what happened. So now we've got ourselves a price model for new business and renewals, which we can put together across multiple years to find out what happens if I charge this price What's going to be my next 20 years of experience for this person? Are they going to crash their car? Are they going to stick around? Can I keep hiking up the price and they'll be so like, distracted they won't even notice? 
you know, things like if this guy rang up at 8 o'clock at night on a Saturday and it's a male, they're probably like really busy, so I can probably set a really high price and, you know, just chuck that data in there, see what the model says. This is not about domain expertise, it's just let the data be the data, build the predictive models and combine them together. So let's start to build another four-step process. So there are some things that consultants never get over, and one thing is the need to do everything as a four-step process. So step one here was to build some models which represent the underlying things that you need to know. Step two is to combine them together. So in fact, let's use the actual terminology. So at ODG, we actually called this thing, not surprisingly, the modeler. And then the thing that combined them together, I mean, it's pretty basic, right? Multiplying two things together across multiple years for each customer. Still, it deserves a name because we were trying to charge money for it. So we called that the simulator, okay? And, you know, the modeler and the simulator of themselves were pretty damn useful to our clients. They used them to then find out, you know, if somebody comes to that, price, that uh, product meeting and says, okay, we're going to hike up by 30% the price right into 25 in this segment, some, you know, they can then simulate that and find out, okay, market share is going to go down by 3%, NPV is going to go up by 4%, there's a 10% chance that we could have a loss next year, so on and so forth. But you can imagine what people wanted now. Once they trusted the model, then they wanted to know what's the best price for everybody. And this is where you need an optimizer. So an optimizer is something which probably fewer people than here than I would like know how to build. Because the math of optimization and the math of predictive modeling although in some ways overlapping, there's not enough of this taught right now in statistics classes or data mining classes. You know, you might learn a bit of really basic convex optimization, but you know, what if there are very funny peaky hills which are hard to get past? You know, are you learning about simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, these kind of systems which allow you to optimize more complex models such as you get out of these kind of simulators. So, you know, here's an area which perhaps some of you might be less familiar with on the algorithm side, and if some of you here are teaching, perhaps it's something that's not in your courses that you might want to really think about, okay? Because if you've got yourself a simulator, if you've got yourself something which can tell you what's going to happen when I pull these levers, right? So remember here, the whole purpose of this, right? We've got some levers that we're going to pull, and what happens to our objectives? That's what this thing is. Okay, so now this is the thing, the optimizer is just the thing which pulls these levers again and again and again to find out what happens to this objective and tries to get it as high as possible, right? So this is the trick. This is the thing where you don't need to write page rank. This is the thing where a huge array of, of you know, places where you're using predictive modeling and you want to drive value, this is a way you can do it a lot using totally off-the-shelf tools. You don't have to invent any new math or algorithms or whatever here. So, you know, that's a little case study of something that's happened. So before I wrap up that case study, let's talk about where that went. Uh, ten years later, I eventually sold that business. Um, it had been used in most English-speaking companies around the world. It pretty much transformed the insurance pricing industry. We had many competitors pop up, and everybody started saying, yep, we do price optimization. I mean, yeah, it's a tiny little niche industry, but it's an important one, and I saw this work. And furthermore, I saw this work in a situation where people said at the start, it won't work. You know, it's too hard. Actuarial science is too well developed. What's the chance of an Aussie philosopher making a breakthrough in this area with clever people? So on and so forth. Okay, but it worked. So let's think about an area where this hasn't yet been done. Maybe you guys will be the first to do it. Not my favorite area, but an area that I know a lot of people are interested in and an area I think is ripe for innovation, which is the area of marketing. So marketing actions, what are marketing actions? We're talking about things like recommendation systems. What products do you put up on that front page of your website? We're talking about the emails that you send to offer people products. We're talking about the discounts that you give people. We're talking about those customer care calls to, uh, you know, to make sure that you don't leave. All these things are marketing actions, right? 
And currently the whole area of, of marketing analytics is fairly much in the dark ages, to my opinion. Some of you might have seen Claudia Perlich's talk, uh, I think yesterday, where she started to talk about how at Media Six Degrees and other companies, they're trying to push things forward, starting to think about things like counterfactuals, okay? This is absolutely on the right track, and I'm gonna push that a few steps further here today. Be interested to see what you guys think. Some of, some of this stuff's being done, some of it's not, um, but let's, let's go through the simple process, okay? So the simple process is to think about the objective first, Okay, so the objective is a marketing action. It's probably to sell a product, okay? But overall, and it's also to make sure you kind of have retention, customer retention, but overall, it's probably to maximize lifetime value of a customer. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. So what are the levers that we have to pull? This is step two. I know you guys can count, but I'll just put the numbers here anyway. Number two, levers. Well, we've kind of talked about those quickly already. There are things like the recommendations that you make um, through your recommendation system. There's the offers you send out. There's your discounts. Uh, there's your uh, kind of customer care calls. All right. What data can we collect? Did you notice something I used there, the verb I used? Not what data do we have, what data can we collect? Because causal data is probably not something you have unless you've been really trying to create it. So what data can I collect about my recommendation systems, my offers, my discounts, and so forth? Maybe before I answer that question, let's have a look at the state of play right now. People are not collecting this data, people are not optimizing this objective. What are they doing instead? Well. When I went to Amazon the other day, which I think has one of the world's best recommendation engines, and it noticed that I've been reading a lot of Terry Pratchett books, it recommended I should buy some more Terry Pratchett books. That is so not helpful, <laughs> right? And I remember also there was a section, if you've seen the section on Amazon, which is like, why don't you treat yourself? It was this, why don't you treat yourself? Um, Linear algebra and its applications. <laughs> so, all right, you know, I don't mean to tease Amazon because I think they're kind of best in class in a lot of ways, but there's a ways we can go here. What's going on? Why isn't this working? They don't have the causal data, or at least they're not using it. The causal data would say, you would have to do some randomized experiments. Try throwing out some weird stuff and find out what happens. Start rec recommending to me, you know, William Faulkner or start recommending to me, you know, common Hawkins CDs, or start recommending, you know, other things from all over the place. Build up the data set which I can then mine using these amazingly sophisticated predictive modeling algorithms we have now to find these deep relationships. And these relationships will now be causal because you've got truly random data. So, you know, this is something which, um, this is something which of itself doesn't require a massive amount of thought to kind of simulate. Um, you know, if you think about it, all we need now is we've got this model which kind of says, um, um, what kind of stuff might I buy? Okay, and we've also got that other recommendation system which is kind of, what kind of stuff do I probably like? Right? So if you combine these two together, I know simulator is a bit of a grand word for this, but it's a framework, so you know, consultants like frameworks. Combine these things together, and what you've got now is something that lets you create this little black box that says, okay, which things can I recommend Jeremy, which he might buy, but he doesn't yet know about? Right? And for those of you in marketing, this is what we call surprising and delighting your customers. You know, this is the thing that gets them coming back. This is the thing that gets them going, Coleman Hawkins, wow, that's a kick-ass jazz musician. You know, how, how did Amazon even know I like saxophone? Right? So there's a very simple use of data collection and of, of simulation and of optimization to do something which really isn't being done yet. It's interesting to see some of the stuff that is happening in this kind of space, you know. Um, like, I don't know if you guys, oh, this is a bit big, isn't it? You guys come across this company, 
um, Zafu. Let me see if I can make this a bit smaller. There we go. So these guys are doing some interesting data collection around, around product recommendations, which they're actually kind of asking you, and this is, this is the thing, right? They're asking, this is data collection. They're asking you things like, what's your shape? How do you feel about when you wear jeans normally? What kind of leg styles do you not like, right? Can you imagine this data set these guys are putting together? And by the way, these guys recommend really nice jeans. These jeans are not from Zafu, that's why they don't fit very well. So you could mine this kind of collected data along with all the other stuff we're talking about to find out what are the genes I can recommend that's going to get people to buy and buy something they wouldn't have otherwise bought. Right? Really interesting data collection. This is some of the stuff that's starting to, starting to go on now. I really need to look at my speaker notes. I don't know where I am. So, oh, there we go. It's about the right spot. So let's take this even further. What are the other levers and, uh, that we can use and how can we use them in, in this marketing situation? How can we pull this all together into a simulator that really deserves the name? Right? Just imagine that we've been putting together this information about, for example, offers. Right? If I give some, not if I give somebody, but in fact I could do a whole bunch of randomized trials around different discounts for different products to different people, I've now got a predictive model of propensity to buy based on discount. Uh, I do cool things like start offering people, um, I just send them three book chapters free from volume one of uh, Neil Stevenson's latest epic series, and which people go on to buy the entire series, right? So I start to look at kind of this propensity to buy across products. Um, I start to look at the results of kind of randomly calling people and finding out, you know, retention based on these kind of customer care calls of different types. So what I'm putting together here are a whole bunch of different models which I can combine together into a simulator which tells me as I change these levers what happens to my objective which is lifetime customer value. Right. And, and what would this do? This would change you from this kind of A-B testy kind of, oh, let's run this offer, we'll use predictive modeling to tell us who's most likely to respond and send it to them, to a situation where every day with every action, what stuff are you showing them on the website? When are you sending them emails? What are you offering them? You would have a predictive model that would know, you know, after somebody has not responded three times in a row, they're probably sick of hearing from you and you shouldn't email them again for six months, you know, what we call a patience model. Uh, all this stuff being pulled together to really optimize the entire sequence of marketing actions. I think this is really interesting. So this is just a simple taking this basic framework. Frameworks need a name. So we call this the drivetrain framework. We'll talk about why in a moment. So take this drivetrain framework, objectives, levers, collectible data, and trying to figure out how to put it together using a modeler, a simulator, and an optimizer. So, uh, when I think about analytics and modeling, and I think I've got a new idea, I normally go back to engineering and find out they did it 30 years ago. So, um, I want to really thank Margit in particular, uh, my colleague who's helped Mike and I with writing this paper um, for this example, uh, which again is just a little bit on the large side. Here's a screenshot from some engineering software. That looks kind of familiar, right? Bunch of models. As I change wing geometry and I run it through these various models and combine them in various ways, and here's my key wing outputs. These are the objectives I'm looking for, right? This is software you can buy right now that's been around for decades. You know, here's an interesting point. I was speaking to Brian Ripley, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, who wrote one of the two books, I guess, on patent recognition, along with Chris Bishop being the other one. And, you know, I asked him where he kind of came up with all the insights to his book. And he said, look, frankly, I read a whole bunch of 1970s engineering papers, and I found everybody had discovered everything we needed to know already. You know. So, you know, I think going back to engineering and understanding what these guys are doing, because these guys are solving real-world problems every day. You know, if these things don't work, planes fall out of the sky. 
right? Whereas if marketing models don't work, somebody doesn't buy a book, you know? So, so you know, I think it's very, very interesting to see how modeling and simulating and optimizing is being used in, in engineering. And, you know, so I want to kind of close these case studies with talking about what I think is like the, the ultimate case study, which is let's look at what happens when you take models in transport to the nth degree. So a predictive model in transport. When is the next bus arriving? Okay, a simple predictive model that tells me the next bus will arrive in three minutes. The things you see on the... Um, Roadways sometimes, do you have these in America that tell you that the expected time to this destination is 25 minutes? Okay, predictive models. Very interesting predictive models, by the way. We ran a um, Kaggle competition on that for New South Wales like a year ago, and I got totally fascinated in this whole topic of predicting traffic flows. But it's just a predictive model, right? Um, another really cool, purely predictive model in transport, um, Flightcaster, do you guys know Flightcaster? You can go to flightcaster.com, type in the uh, flight number, and it uses predictive modeling to estimate the probability that it's gonna be on time, right? using, using a massive amount of collected data. Then the next step, use the GPS to actually tell you how to get there. Right? There's cool things like uh, another great Aussie company, Rome to Rio, that's uh, R-O-M-E number two, rio.com. You can actually type in any two parts of the world and it'll say, take this train, walk to here, fly to there, take this bus, right? So this is actually using a simulator or an optimizer behind the scenes to figure out what are the different things I can do, what's gonna happen and find the best one, right? So there's an interesting next step in transport. Take it a step further still. What if we've got predictive models that tell me as I hit the gas pedal, this is how the car's going to respond and the brake. And if I have sensors in my car, then it probably means there's a pedestrian that's about to step out. You know where this is going, right? The Google self-driving car. Right? Now there's a real engineering uh, marvel, which is basically a whole bunch of predictive models being integrated together and optimized over. So, you know, I think when we lift our sights, as to what we can do, we can do things like build a search engine that gives you what you want. Build an insurance price optimization company which actually optimizes price. Maybe build a marketing system which actually doesn't piss people off. Recommends stuff you don't know about. Sends you discounts for things you want. Stops bothering you when, you're, when I'm bored of listening to you, you know. And nowadays, building self-driving cars. So, as I said, this is a framework. Um, it is, in some ways, a work in progress. Um, uh, as I said, Mike Lukides and I have this paper coming out in a couple of weeks, and we've started to circulate preprints among some of the data science community. It's taught us a lot of stuff. It's taught us that the vocabulary in this area is very poorly defined. Nobody agrees on it. It's taught us that different people think different areas of this are important in different ways. It reminds us that data science is in many ways a pretty early industry, and we don't yet really understand how to even communicate about how to maximize its potential. So what we're doing with O'Reilly is we're starting to think about ways of turning this framework into more than just a proposal, but into a discussion. And you know, so I'd really invite you to get involved in that discussion. Uh, I'm not exactly sure yet what form that'll take, but uh, I'd love you guys to reach out through the Strata website or come and see me, tell me your thoughts. Are you doing this already? Is this ridiculous idea altogether? Questions, I would, I would love to hear about them. Um, so I've got um, five minutes, and so if anybody's got questions, you can either yell out or you can come up to the, the microphone. I'd be happy to take them. Okay, so the question is, um, how do you charge differential prices in financial services when there's regulatory environment about how you're allowed to price? I'm not sure how much I can tell you here, other than that you can. Um, generally speaking, those regulations tell you that you have to be able to provide evidence that there is some reason that you can price differently. An overfitted model can create the evidence you need. Um, let me put it that way. I kind of wish you hadn't asked me that and I hadn't have told you that, but you know, <laughs> there are, 
There are ways of collecting data, let's put it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you guys go and have lunch. Thanks so much for coming.